Today we're going to bring you another massive storyline right here at Comic Storian. We're going to tell you the story of Brian Michael Bendis' Guardians of the Galaxy. You see, when the first movie came out, Brian Michael Bendis started a new comic book line featuring the movie version of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Over the course of, like, four to seven years, somewhere in there, I know, a very large gap, uh, we've had multiple storylines from New Origins for Star-Lord, different origins for Rocket and Groot, and we've also had various other tales of the Guardians coming together, fighting against things, even Peter Quill becoming an Emperor. Well, we're going to take all of those videos that we did, because they do tell one giant story, and we're going to bring it to you now. So, enjoy this super long Guardians of the Galaxy vs. Thanos video, and don't forget, this was done over the course of many years, so our editing style and intros and even the voiceovers I've done for characters does change as we're going. Enjoy. was being escorted into a prison, and we really don't know why, but the guards, they were messing with him. Just I am Groot over and over again! It's my favorite game to play with this dub! Watch this! Who are you again? And then he tases Groot. I am Groot, he says sadly, knowing where this is going. Oh come on, don't be shy! Introduce yourself! The guard tases him again. I'm sorry, I have a bad memory. What's your- And as he tases him again, Groot has had enough and he breaks out of his cuffs, screaming, I am Groot! He then slams both guards against the wall, and he grabs the one that was tasing him by the head. I am Groot! Throwing the guard on the ground, he says over and over again, I am Groot! I am Groot! I am Groot! Two other guards come over, and they throw Groot to the ground. Time for the pit. Throw him in with the other problem child. Groot gets thrown into the cell, and he just lays there. He doesn't want to get up. He doesn't want to fight. Until... Someone in the corner says to him, So what are you in for? Groot looks up to see a raccoon in a prison outfit. I am Groot. Yeah, I didn't ask for your name, don't care. What'd you do? I am Groot. And then Rocket looks at him all funny. Oh, this'll be fun. Just stay off my side, it's cramped and ugly. But it's my side. I am Groot. He then slaps his forehead. This isn't what I meant when I asked for a plant. As they are forced to be cellmates, they end up going around together, and at the cafeteria, Rocket has had enough, and he tells Groot to back off! I don't want any friends! I am Groot, Groot says confused. Oh, are you? I didn't catch it the first 2,000 flarkin times you said it. Nobody understands what you're saying, so do us all a favor and shut up and stay off my side. And that's what Groot did. He ignored Rocket and he left him alone. But way later, the guards that Groot injured were torturing him again, asking for his name. When things changed, Rocket yelled out, Hey! I think you got his name when he put you and your friend in the infirmary a month ago. Touch him again, and he won't even make it there. Groot gets up, and he stands next to his new friend, smiling. Stop looking at me like that. So they got to walk away from the guards, and Groot returned the favor by growing trees and a small bed for Rocket in their cell. Rocket smiled, and he was amazed that Groot did this for him. But just then, the lights were turned off, and the guards walked in again. The lights won't be on for a few seconds. Plenty of time to teach you two a lesson. And Groot leaped in, yelling, I am Groot! Rocket replied to him, Good idea! I'll take the big guy! Wait, what? A bigger smile forms on Groot's face as he turns to Rocket while beating on the guards. I am Groot? I did, yeah! So Groot grabbed him, and he held him as close as he could. I'm all ears, pal. So Groot asks him, I am Groot! Don't know. I've been stuck in a cell with you for months. Guess I got good ears. So what are you in for? I am Groot. <laughs> are you serious? You're crazy! And with that, the two of them became inseparable pals. They went on many crazy adventures, and they made other friends in the form of Star-Lord, Drax, and Gamora. And no matter what happened, they did it together. Peter Quill was 10 years old when he saw his first alien. The experience was not a very good one, as he watched his mother give her life in order to save his. So eight years later, what did Peter want to do? Go into space. 
As Peter sits in the cockpit of a ship, warnings begin to blare that the enemy ships are closing in, and he shouts that he knows already! Peter goes through the controls, saying that it's high on heat but low on compression. Ions are up, but the detrinium is down. What else do you need? The onboard computer says that it is sorry. It cannot answer that question. And Peter says, fine, engage thrusters. Explosions begin to go off and the computer says, fatality. Then another voice shouts for Peter to open up. He crawls out of the simulated cockpit and he tells Freddy that he would have just let him die in space. Freddy says, no can do. It's almost six in the morning and if he keeps going like this, he is eventually going to get caught. Besides, they have nine ships all with thruster problems in the hangar that need fixing. And Haywood called out, so he's gotta clean the floors too. Peter sighs while pushing the vacuum, thinking about how this is a great ship in all of her glory. But all of Peter's hard work is one day going to pay off. He's going to be able to fly the greatest ship known to mankind, the Astron 1, and become the greatest astronaut ever known. It's just at the current moment, no one knows it. Peter stares at the Astron, and another cadet shouts that it's coming, and a few seconds later, the Kree Warbird shoots by. The Warbird is a ship that the Avengers had donated to the space program after their last adventure in space, and no one's been able to learn it's faster than light warp drive. Once the Warbird lands, another cadet by the name of Hastings jumps out shouting that she did everything, and it still won't jump. All it does is stall. A few of the other engineers go over the data trying to figure it out, but the other cadet, Isaac, says that it's obvious. They need to drop the hammer and push it harder. Force the warp drive to wake up. Across the room, Peter says that that's a dumb idea. If the ship's stalling, they shouldn't push her harder. What they should be doing is cutting the thrusters to free up the faster-than-light drive, and boom! Warp speed! Everyone stares at Peter, and Isaac says that that's the dumbest thing he's ever heard. Going slower is the opposite goal of a warp drive. Peter steps up, shouting that it's a precision instrument, and they're driving her like a sledgehammer and Isaac shouts at him to get back to vacuuming. Let the real pilots handle this one. One of the engineers steps up between them and yells at both of them to just get back to their work. Isaac, go run a flight plan. Mechanic, do whatever it is you do. Isaac laughs, saying that that's right, Grease Monkey. You don't have what it takes to be an astronaut. And Peter's response? Well, he cracked Isaac across the face. Later, Commander Lisa Chang calls Peter into the Astron to discuss Peter's later running. He says that he asked for it, and Lisa tells him that she's referring to the hundreds of unauthorized hours in the simulators. He lights up, telling her, My flying's pretty slick, huh? Do I get a job or what? And she sighs, telling him, no, he definitely does not get a job. The Astron will be going on a mission to colonize another planet. They have no room for wild cards. Her and his mother were like sisters, which is why she helped him out with getting this mechanic job. But this, she can't shield him from it any longer. Therefore, he is hereby discharged from the Astron 1 program. Pack up and report for reassignment. Peter tries to say, but just look at my flying! But Lisa stops him, shouting that he doesn't understand what it means to be an astronaut. What would his mother have said about all of this? Peter turns, hitting a box of parts, and he takes the Astron 1 external bolt, hatch wrench, and he runs to his room. While packing up, he looks down at the Badoon ship that came to Earth, and then the picture of him and his mother and Lisa when he was younger. Peter smiles, remembering something that his mother once said. Pick a high target, and you're gonna hit it. So a short while later, back on the Astron bridge, Lisa asks herself, where did she go wrong with Peter? And then there's an emergency call about an unauthorized launch. The Kree Warbird rockets into the air, and Peter shouts, YO! Lisa radios to the Warbird, yelling to Peter that they will shoot him down, but Peter continues to fly. Hastings and Isaac follow closely behind, prepared to fire, and once the lasers are shot, Peter starts to hit the controls. Lisa radios that he needs to stop this, but Peter looks through the system, telling her that he's high on heat, low on compression, ions up, what else do you need? Peter then cuts the thrusters, and Hastings calls out that he's slowing down. They should be able to hit, but then light surrounds the Warbird, and seconds later, the ship disappears. Back on the bridge, Lisa shouts that he did it. The warp drive is online. Line. They have the data for the Astron! And out in space, Peter shouts, Suck it, everyone! I'm in space! Except, the Warbird stalls and loses all of its power. Peter tries to access the controls, but with no response. Peter starts hitting it, and he tells himself, Great! I just got into space, and now I'm blowing it. Three days later, while floating around in space, Peter gets to work trying to fix whatever it is that went wrong when a voice over the radio says that it looks like he's having mechanical problems. Peter looks around and says, Holy crap, yes, this is Peter Quill. Thank you, thank you. I never thought I was going to be rescued up here. The voice tells him that they're not here to rescue him. They're pirates. They steal things, so prepare to be boarded. A few moments later, the warbird is brought aboard a giant pirate ship. And the aliens surround the ship, and a voice says to not give them any trouble. They just want the ships, and then they'll be on their merry way. The leader steps on board with another shot in that he's about to be robbed by Yondu and the Ravagers. The Ravagers look around and they find nothing, and Yondu notices a compartment open and shouts, You better hurry and climb out of the ship's guts before I drag you out by your eyeballs. 
Peter thinks about it for a second, and then he realizes he has a plan. He climbs out of the bottom of the ship, and then he crosses the wires to simulate a radiation leak, which would mean suddenly the doors on the ship shut, trapping everyone on board of the Warbird. Everyone inside shouts, what the heck is going on? And then they feel a rumble. Back in the holding bay, Peter drives a crane, pushing the Warbird back into space, and he yells, walk the plank, suckers! As the Warbird floats on, Peter then shouts that this ship is now the property of Peter Quill, king of all pirates! That is until Yondu tackles him to the ground. Yondu yells that he's going to pull out his lung. And, and that's when Peter pulls the trigger on the gun that he had taken from home. The giant laser fires and Yondu grabs his arm yelling, that for track and hurt. Peter runs off into the air vents trying to come up with another plan while Yondu goes back to searching. Yondu continues to shout that this is his ship. I can hear where you're going. There's no way that you could steal my ship. Yondu then heads into the treasure room and Peter thinks that he could use this to his advantage. What do pirates love more than anything? Treasure, loot, booty, just got to. But as Yondu walks in, he sees Peter's helmet and he charges after him. He then stops when he sees that it's just the helmet on a stick. Suddenly, the giant gold statue next to him starts to creak as it tips over and crushes him. A short while later, Yondu begins to wake up and he looks at his now bandaged arm, stating that that was stupid of him. He then turns back to see Peter at the controls and Peter asks, how exactly do I fly my new ship? Yondu tells him that this isn't your ship. And Peter says, that's fine, I'll figure it out in a few minutes. Don't be a sore loser about it. As Peter continues to work the panel, Yondu begins to pick up the cuffs and he sneaks on Peter, banging the helmet with a gun. Yandu then says, you really thought you could take me prisoner with my handcuffs? Think again, you holy flarkenards, you're a kid. Peter sticks the gun into Yandu's stomach, telling him, I'm a kid with a gun. Yandu pushes the gun to Peter's head, telling him that he's keyholed men more decent than him for less. So here's the deal. I'm going to take what we want from your ship, and then I'm going to let you drift out in space. Put your fate into the hands of the stars. Peter says that's a stupid deal. How about he uh, lets him stay with them as a member of his crew? Uh, I trapped your friends, stole your ship, found your treasure, and almost got away with it. Yandu tells him that he's just a dirt poor boy from Earth. Not worth a damn here. Peter shouts, come on, that ship you stole? I stole it first, and I killed my first alien when I was 10, proving to the people who told me that I couldn't make it to space wrong. Peter's eyes begin to water, and he says, please, I have nowhere else to go. A little while later, once all of the Ravagers are back on board, one of the aliens asks Yondu, why did he do it? He looks over at Peter, and he says, kid is one of us. Maybe one day he'll be a great pirate, or maybe we'll just let him clean our ship. But while Peter pushes the Star-Lord Hovvac around, he tells himself that this is his new job, for now. Because if these aliens can be pirates, so can he. As the days pass, Peter stops when he can look at the universe that he worked so hard to see. And as he does, Yondu says that someone must have been sleeping since his floors ain't getting cleaned. Yandu notices Peter holding a picture, and when he looks at it, he says that it must be the Badoon ship that he's looking for, the one that he asked if they could find a hundred times. Peter laughs, asking, What if I asked you 101 times? And Yandu asks him, What would you even do if we found them? Peter says that he would shoot it out of the sky, throw it into the sun, pee on the ashes, and dance on their grave. Yandu tells him that that's the thing about space. It ain't complicated. It's all about the big nothing out there with the occasional thing of interest. Steal one thing, avoid another. That's the big secret to space. Peter then takes out the picture of his mother, saying that he's looking for that ship because of... Here. The other woman is Lisa Chang, who became a commander. But she would never have gotten the four warp drives operational if it wasn't for him. And Yandu stops asking, An Earther ship with four warp drives? Peter laughs, telling him, Hell yeah! Reverse engineered them from the Kree. I was the one who cracked it. I know all of the ins and outs and all of the secrets. So maybe I would be a better mechanic than a janitor. Or maybe even a pirate. Yandu tells him, You know, maybe you're right. Maybe you do have what it takes to be a pirate. So how about I take you out and see what kind of trouble we can make? Later, down on an alien planet, the alien jock at his muscle hands gun to Yondu and Peter, telling them that the last time someone brought someone new, he ended up spending 30 years in the Spartox solar prison. Yondu tells him to relax. Peter's part of the crew. And the two begin to argue. As Peter stands close to the ledge, he begins to fall, and then another alien catches him, and he trips him to fall off. Jock asks, what is that? But Yondu takes Jock's gun, telling him, that's enough. We're not here to pull one over on you. Jock starts running, shouting, I knew this was a setup! And as Jock goes to jump off a ledge, Yandu grabs Peter and he jumps off. Everyone lands on a passing trans car, and Jock starts jumping from car to car. Yandu chases and corners Jock, telling him that this isn't a screw job, now let's just... But the alien from before jumps onto the car, knocking Yandu into the cab. Peter asks if he needs help, and Yandu shouts, No! Go catch Jock! So Peter quickly spins back and tackles into him. The two go crashing into the restaurant down below, and as Peter starts to get back up, Jock makes a break for it and escapes, but soon after, Yandu jumps down shouting, You idiot! Peter then pulls out a gem telling him, yeah, he escaped, but I did manage to swipe this. So did I do good? 
The Jian dude grabs the gem, telling him, You did better than good. This is the beginning of great things. So from there on out, Peter went to living the life of a space pirate, getting into fights, drinking, making out with hot alien women, and even entering brawls and winning them. However, what Peter isn't seeing is that these adventures are being staged. One night during karaoke, Yandu tells everyone that he would like to make a toast to their newest and greatest member, Petey! It's time that they make it official, so they decided to make him a full-time Ravager. How about that? Peter asks if he really means it, and Yandu says, A serious as a scroll. I even got you a little gift. Yandu holds out a tracking gem that shows a picture of the Badoon ship that Peter's been looking for. Peter says that he doesn't know what to say, and Yandu tells him that there's one small thing that we want to return, and that's the Astron 1. The Astron recently flew by a probe drone, so we're gonna take it. Peter tells him no, they can't do that, and Yandu takes the tracking gem back, telling him, You're one of us, right? Besides, you said it yourself. All those people said you couldn't cut it. So, it'll be a ship for a ship. You get the Badoon ship, we get the Astron. So, back to our toast, and everyone shouts, To Petey Quill! And Peter tells himself, All right, I can't blow this. As the preparations are set, Peter and the pirates make their way over to where the Astron is flying, and Peter sneaks in. But as he does, he thinks to himself that this is what he's become. A traitor to seven billion people on Earth. No pressure or anything. He quietly moves through the ship until he gets to one of the access terminals and begins to disable the shields. But as he does, someone shouts for him to halt. He turns back, pointing his gun to see the worst person that he could have run into. Lisa. Lisa shouts that whoever he is, lower his weapon and remove his mask. Peter listens, but then Lisa gets a call saying that they are being boarded by pirates. So she grabs Peter, asking, who's hijacking her ship? Over the radio, Yondu announces that everyone just needs to relax. You're currently being boarded by the Ravagers. Once everyone has moved to the bridge, Yondu tells Lisa that so long as they surrender their ship, he can guarantee the lives of her crew. Fair? She tells him no, she won't accept that. So he shouts, all right, we're going to be taking your warp drives and leaving you to drift. Your face will be in the hands of the stars. High and dry, that's the pirate way. He then grabs Peter, telling him, Cheer up, don't forget, your biggest wish is about to come true. Peter smacks his hand away, telling him, Yeah, yeah, as if you really cared. Yandu angrily tells him, This job isn't over yet, so I need you to pull it together. Now go wave your gun before I leave you high and dry. Peter points his gun at Hastings and Isaac, and Isaac comments that he probably isn't so tough without his gun. In fact, he probably couldn't hack into space, so he just has to steal someone else's ship. Probably doesn't even know how to fly this thing. Peter grabs Isaac by the throat, shouting that he's a better pilot than he would ever be. But during the struggle, Hastings runs up and punches Peter, and his mask begins to shorn out. The Astron crew stares at Peter Quill, saying, No way. And Yandu shouts, That is enough! This changes nothing! Now everyone sit down before the commander gets it! Peter grabs Yondu, telling him not to hurt her or he will, but Yondu asks, What? Polish the deck? You're just a janitor, so you better know your place. Hastings shouts for Isaac to hit the warp, but Yondu punches her in the stomach, telling her, Look, I'm trying to be a nice guy here, but I will not hesitate to kill each and every one of you. Just as Yondu begins to calm down, one of the Ravenders shouts that Peter is gone. Meanwhile, on the connecting tube back to the Ravager's ship, Peter leads Lisa, telling her that they need to hurry. Lisa stops him and hugs him, telling him that she's so glad that he's alive, but they need to go save everyone, and Peter stops her, telling her no. They're gonna steal the pirate ship, and they're going to get out of here. Lisa tells him no, the Astron, but Peter stops her, telling her that he wasn't a part of the mission, remember? So Lisa tries to convince him, and he continues to shout, No! Those pirates will do whatever they want. I learned what I needed from them, and it's time to steal their ship. Besides, I have the tracking gem. Now we can go get the Badoons that killed my mother. Lisa holds her head down, stating that she's sorry she failed them. She promised his mother to keep him safe, so please don't do this. And he shouts, no way! She was my mother, and I will do whatever it takes to bring the ones who killed her down. Lisa turns back, telling him that it doesn't matter. She isn't leaving her crew, so come with her and they can fix this. Peter stops and tells her that they're going to kill her, so please think of her own life. She stands there, asking if he's asking her to consider her life over the lives of her crew. Well, she's an astronaut, so what is he? A short while later, one of the Ravagers throws Lisa back in with the rest of the crew, and the engineer asks, where is Peter hiding? Is he planning a sneak attack? And she tells him no. Peter's running away. Another Ravager says that they couldn't find him, and Yondu notices the tracking gem is gone. He shouts that he must be on their ship. They've been looking in the wrong place, but another Ravager shouts, look outside. On the screen, all of Yondu's treasure is floating away, and he shouts that he's going to kill him! All of the Ravagers start to run back to their ship, and Yondu tells them all that it was a trap. They need to hold down the Astron. So all of the Ravagers run into the vault's room and Peter slams the bulk shut and locks them inside. He then heads over to the ship's controls and hits the thrusters, full blast damaging the connecting tube. While the ship begins burning its own fuel, Peter heads over to the emergency fuel containers and begins to break them. Once it's all done, he heads back to the cargo bay and tells himself that he has one shot at this. He can launch himself back over to the Astron, and it's just a simple physics problem, except he sucks at math. Peter grabs the Star-Lord hover vac, now strapped with two small rockets, and he flips a switch. The thrusters light up and they take off towards the Astron. 
down. And as he flies through space, there's a tug at his leg. Yondu is punching him and he headbutts Peter, but Peter manages to kick him off. He grabs onto the hover vac and he looks back wondering why Yondu is smiling. Oh, it's because he has the tracking gem. Peter gives the handles as much slack as he can to try and reach for it, and he unknowingly lets go before grabbing the gem. The hoverback continues on his own as he tries to grab it, as suddenly a hand reaches out, grabbing his arm. Lisa says that that was nice flying, Star-Lord. Did he manage to get the gem? Peter looks back at the floating gem and says, Nah, I'm done. Let's go back to the Astron. As some time passes, the Astron reached a planet Zervis, and it began its next permanent colonization. And Lisa says that she's got to hand it to him. They couldn't have done it without him, so she's sorry that she kicked him off the mission. Peter says that he's actually sorry for what he said about his mom, and Lisa stops him telling him it's okay. She stopped grieving and being angry. That's when she first started planning this mission. She then asks if he's sure that he won't be staying, and Peter says not to worry about it. He's going to visit. The two of them hug, and Lisa asks, where is Star-Lord off to now? Peter says that it's a big galaxy. He's gonna go find out what it has in store for him. He was an okay astronaut at best, and kind of a ridiculous pirate. But together he's become something even better. He's become the legendary Star-Lord. Kids upstairs, a woman shouts, and the Badoon tell Peter, Don't move! We have you dead to rights, Star-Lord! I warned you, I've been killing Badoon since I was ten, Peter says, as he makes his face mask fade away. When I was 10, I ate a human brain every day, the Badoon replies to him, grinning as he takes Peter's gun. They take Peter Quill a prisoner, and they begin to leave the orphanage where all of this is happening. They came for one thing, the Mandalay gem that Peter hid there a while ago. And since there's also a bounty on Peter's head conveniently right now, the Badoon are going to get a two-for-one deal. They haul Peter to their ship, where the Badoon explains that the evil villain Mr. Knife is the one that is after Peter Quill and any weird weapons that the Badoon happen to come across. Apparently, he's gunning for Earth for some reason. They then leave Peter alone in the cell after knocking him out. When he comes to, he kicks off the communicator that he's hidden in his boot, and he dials up the greatest girl in the galaxy, Kitty Pride. He calls to make sure that Earth is okay, because if Mr. Knife is gunning for Earth, did he miss something? And once he finds out it is, they have a little bit of small talk until a guard comes down to see who Peter's talking to. Kitty snaps, are you calling me for prison? But the guard walks in and Peter introduces them. Kitty, meet Thumbnail, Thumbnail, meet Kitty. Thumbnail hate cutie talk. So Peter jumps up, blasting Thumbnail with his rocket boots, throwing him out of the cell. He then makes his way out of the jail cell and through the ship, where he grabs the Mandalay gem and blows a hole in the side of the ship, before making his epic getaway into space using his face mask. He then travels back to Earth, where he drops off his life savings with the orphanage. He didn't tell them that it was his, he told them that he sold the Mandalay gem, but he had to make it up to them. He then takes off for space, devising his next plan only to be stopped by another ship. A woman gets out of this one and demands that he come with them by the order of Captain Victoria, the daughter of the former Emperor Jason Spartox. Wait, Peter thinks, I have a sister? You see, Peter is also the son of Jason of Spartox. She brings him onto their ship where once again he finds himself in handcuffs. There is a mighty bounty on Peter's head and she intends to collect on it for the sake of Spartox. Peter tries to play the family card, which honestly didn't work too well, so then he convinces her to go along with a plan of his by convincing her that there's more money to be made with his plan than turning him in. So Victoria brings Peter to the bounty hunter, and they prepare to turn him in. But just when she's about to collect her reward, she betrays the guards, and Peter breaks his cuffs, grabbing the bounty guy hostage. Peter then tells them to transfer all of the money that's in the vault into his account. Well, the rest of the Vendor Doom guards are a tad unhappy that they're about to be out of a job, and they open fire on Peter and Victoria. Epic maneuvers happen, and the two of them manage to get off of the planet. And as they prepare to leave, Peter leaves his sister with all of their earnings. She'll use it for the good of their people, the people of Spartox. But she asks him, why leave it all? And why does he seem to have a death wish? So Peter finally explains what he's doing. You see, Peter was trapped in the Cancerverse with Richard Ryder and Thanos. When he and Thanos got out, they made a pact not to fight each other for a while. And that was Peter's mistake. Thanos has been running free out there, making problems and killing thousands. And he feels that he is to blame because he can't stop Thanos. So he doesn't want the money that they just earned. He's gonna go after Thanos. And he assumes that he won't be back. After leaving his sister and her wishing him luck, he went to a bar where a pretty lady tased him to bring him in for the bounty that the Badoon have on him again. This time, his cellmates are a spy from the Spartox Empire that got caught, and a little Badoon child that just won't talk. So Peter calls up Kitty Pride again, and her first comment is, You're calling me from jail again? Uh, yeah, never mind that. I need a distraction. Can you do something in the lingerie department? Dream on, spaceman. Okay, okay, how about something scary? So Kitty Pride gets into the scariest outfit she can find. 
a giant banana suit, and she screams, Ooga chaka, Ooga chaka, Ooga chaka, Ooga chaka. The guard rushes into the room terrified, and Pierre takes his gun with a yoink and knocks him out. The three prisoners run into the ship, and the spy tells Peter that he'll see him later. The legendary Star-Lord is a little too high profile for his plans, leaving Peter alone with the Badoon child. But that works in Peter's favor, as the child points to a sewer chute as their escape, and they slide down to freedom. Well, not freedom. It shoots them into the starport, where Peter falls in love with the ship that he's going to steal. The bad boy. They both run onto the ship, and the onboard computer introduces itself as Lydia and welcomes them to the bad boy. Peter asks if they have enough fuel to make a break for it, and Lydia tells them only if they can play Aquabats as they go. He answers with, only if I can sing every word. Okay, I kind of like you now, but I only have enough juice for two people. And that's when behind them, Peter and the Badoon see that the spy has snuck on board. Kick the Badoon off, Peter! Let's get out of here! Peter and the Badoon child both look at the spy, and then they kick him off the ship singing, WE WERE SUPER RAD! He then drops off the Badoon Child at the orphanage, asking them to watch him, and then he gets back onto the ship with some alone time with Kitty Pryde on the hologram collar, until Lydia reports that she has found what Peter is looking for. With this ship in the Mandalay Gem, Peter is taking this fight to Earth to fight Thanos. Kitty gets all excited, you're coming for a visit, Peter? Yes, but this isn't a vacation. There's something I need to handle, Kitty. Furious, she hangs up on him, calling him a dumbass. But Peter knows she'll understand. This is Thanos. He needs to finish what he started in the Cancerverse. On Earth's moon, Thanos is building a monument to his love, death. But Peter Quill comes rocketing in full force, and he slams Thanos into the planet, knocking him back. Quill, you're late. Our truce has been up for quite some time. And you've been busy doing some bad things. Very bad things, Thanos things. I'm surprised that you're surprised. You really went to town while my hands are tied, didn't you, Thanos? Well, the party's over. Oh, is it? Thanos says as he blasts the spot Peter was standing at. But Peter has a secret weapon, the Mandalay Gem, and it's granting him insane amounts of power as he rockets through the explosion to Thanos' surprise. You got it, big boy, and I'm gonna make you pay for everything you did. Thanos grabs Peter by the back of the head and he slams him into his knee, causing Peter's nose to bleed. Ouch! My nose! My mother gave me this nose! They go back and forth for a few seconds until Thanos grabs the gem off of Peter's chest. This gem is celestial technology. You have no idea what you are doing. But he reels back in pain as the crystal refuses to leave Peter. I don't know, Thanos. You tell me. Does it feel like I know what I'm doing? And he bombards Thanos with the power of the gem. He then leaps onto Thanos, ready to finish this. And Thanos grins. If you destroy me here, this moon will be destroyed. And if this moon dies, the Earth dies. Will you make the Earth pay for the price of your guilt? Peter stands up, and he walks away. Sit tight while I call the Avengers, and we'll figure out what to do with you. By the time they get here, I'll be gone. Either they won't believe you, or they'll chastise you for letting me get away. Again. Heed my counsel, coward. Give up your vengeance. You have too much milk in your veins. The truce is over for you, but it is also over for me. Beware. And he takes off for space, leaving Peter right there. Lydia flies the ship in close. That was pretty hardcore, Peter. I guess. I'm gonna take Thanos' advice. But there's something I need to do first. Meanwhile on Earth, Kitty is debating if she should end this with Peter. He's cute and all, but he seems so shady. That's when the young Iceman comes running in to tell her that someone wrote a message in the snow! While Peter still has some things to do, he did take some time to lay some flowers in the snow, spelling, Kitty, I'm sorry, XOXO, dumbass. This left Agent Venom stranded on a very populated planet, alone and scared. The people of this planet kept calling him insane for bonding with a symbiote, calling it a dirty Clintar. After a little time of trying to figure out how he was going to get off of this planet, he lost control and the Venom symbiote took over. But the Venom symbiote is even more terrified than Flash Thompson was. Why is he hated? He's only been doing good recently. And what is a Clintar? Are they more of him? So he walks around the planet asking for travel back to Earth. If he can just get back home, everything will be okay. The people of Earth have come to accept him. But even using fear doesn't get him a ride back to Earth, and he leaves some terrified pilots behind. Venom's good now. Why can't people see that? He just wants to go home. So he goes back to an alien that called him a Clintar when Flash Thompson was in control. He asks the man to explain what is a Clintar. He wants to know everything he can, but the man refuses to answer anything. He just wants that dirty Clintar out of his shop. 
when suddenly Gamora comes walking into the shop and she sees Agent Venom standing there. Human? The Guardians have been looking all over the galaxy for you. Are you alright? And as she asks that, she's thrown out the window by Venom. You see, Gamora never trusted the symbiote, and once Agent Venom joined the team, she wanted to remove it from Flash Thompson and kill it. But Flash stopped her. Now that Flash is unconscious and Venom is terrified, it doesn't trust her. You've gone mad, she yells back. This is all a trick! You sent me here to die! You sent me into space so you could ruin me! Venom screams out. And Gamora refrains from fighting back. If there's anything left of you, Thompson, speak now. The Venom just growls. I'll kill you all! So Gamora runs at Venom, leaping over it and stabbing him with her staff. But before Venom can react, she yells, Now! And just then, Rocket Raccoon shoots a gun out at the symbiote that sucks it up and pulls it off of Flash. As Flash hits the ground now that he's legless again without the symbiote, Gamora turns to the Guardians and asks, What took you so long? You only called us a minute ago, Star-Lord says. I was in the bathroom, Drax says, and Rocket just grins. As Flash begins to come to his senses again, he asks, What happened? Oh, I should have never come. I can control the symbiote on Earth. This whole thing of going into space was a bad idea. And then he just passes out. Star-Lord looks at him. Poor guy. And I was really starting to feel bad that we lost him. So no one really knows what happened to Flash, and they make a decision to just get him back to Earth. The Guardians did lose him after all. Back on the ship, Groot and Rocket are slightly guarding the vial that Rocket is keeping the symbiote in, and Groot just finds it fascinating. That is, until it breaks out of the vial and it wraps around Groot while Rocket's back is turned. Rocket turns around to see his buddy under the control of the symbiote, and Venom Groot says, I am Venom! Star-Lord Gamora and Drax all see Rocket come running out of the cargo hold, with Venom Groot chasing them, yelling, I am Venom! What's going on? Star-Lord asks, and Drax runs in and begins swinging, I have this! But Groot quickly slams him into the ground and throws him into the ship's controls, turning off the gravity. No one has any idea what to do, with Rocket yelling, Help Groot! Somebody help Groot! So Gamora demands Venom release the Wood God, and she will spare him a brutal death. And Rocket just snaps back, Not like that! But Star-Lord has this as he fires his guns along with Rocket at Groot. Sorry, buddy. The Venom symbiote quickly jumps off of Groot and it begins to look for a new host. And it sees a certain talking raccoon that it would love to be on right now. But Rocket panics and begins to blind fire at the symbiote. Eventually, it does manage to get onto Rocket though and it wraps around his arm until we have Venom Rocket Raccoon. He forms a massive gun on his arm and he turns to Drax and Groot. Don't come one step closer. Get off my ship. I have business to conduct and I'll be more than happy if I never see any of you again. And Groot looks at him simply asking, I am Groot? Venom Rocket Raccoon begins disarming the Guardians, but not actually hurting any of them. And then he points his gun at Star-Lord. You've always done right by me, Quill. So I don't want to hurt you or anyone else. But I need this ship and I need you and the others to get off. But Drax reaches out to try and grab Venom Rocket Raccoon, so the symbiote in response transfers over to Drax, creating Venom Drax. Well, as you can imagine, no one can face off with Venom Drax. Flash Thompson eventually wakes up though, and he sees that something is definitely wrong in the ship. He crawls out of the med bay because right now he doesn't have his legs, as it's the symbiote that creates legs for him. And he sees the entire team unconscious, but still breathing and he sees Venom Drax at the helm of the ship. Venom Drax turns around and says, We're here. I'm home. Flash looks out the window and he sees Planet Symbiote. The Venom Symbiote tells Flash that he is home. He's been summoned here, and he doesn't know if this is the end of their journey together, but he has come to admire Flash Thompson. And then he leaves Drax's body and he crawls out of the ship. Everyone wakes up and realizes that it's true. They're now in an uncharted part of an uncharted sector of the galaxy. They've got Venom symbiotes flying all around them in their anti-gravity whatever kind of planet they have. And shockingly, they're not attacking or trying to bond with the Guardians. After a little contemplation, Flash decides that he's going to present himself and let the symbiotes bond with him and try to see what's going on. While everyone tries to stop him, he eventually gets to one of the symbiotes and he bonds with it. And all Groot can say is, I am Groot! And Gamora replies with, what can we do? But everything's okay, because Flash responds with, Wow, I was right. They want to talk to us. They don't have mouths or the ability for verbal communication. If you let them temporarily bond with you, they can explain what's going on. 
The whole team refuses, except for Groot, and he allows it to bond with him. So following his lead, everyone else agrees to bond with the symbiote, hoping that this works out for the best. And the symbiotes explain, We are the Klintar. We are the mind and soul of the warrior, and we want to spread the true ways of a noble and virtuous galaxy. Like yourselves, we are dedicated to making a great society. To get to this society, we need to find hosts to create a perfect bond to reach our ultimate goal. This means that we need a perfect blend of moral and physical ideals. If we can find that, we can create the ultimate noble warrior. But because we need such a delicate balance, there are few members of very few species that can rise to the occasion. If the balance is even slightly off, it'll create something that is monstrous and corrupt. Because of this, our reputation throughout the galaxy has been tarnished. Once a symbiote becomes corrupt, we break it off from our home world and our hive mind, and without a connection to us, a damaged Clintar will spiral out of control. The corrupted Clintar will then try to spread lies and half-truths to further their own agendas, further harming our reputation in the galaxy. But even a broken symbiote can bring true heroism. And that is why we are honored to have Eugene Flash Thompson with us here today. And so we are grateful to you Guardians for bringing him to us. We've been aware of your Agent Venom for quite some time, and we are so happy that throughout their struggles, their bond has made the warrior whole and a planet safer. But since the Venom symbiote only contained a fractured connection to us, it was frightened and it began to react to its surroundings irrationally. But now that they are here, we can fix and repair the symbiote and create the perfect warrior that they are supposed to be. Eugene Flash Thompson, you now have new abilities and knowledge that you didn't know you had before, and you have a connection to us finally. You are now a warrior of the galaxy, and you may now leave with our gratitude and blessings. As a thank you, we have cured all of your bodies of their poisons and cancers. Cancers? Who had cancer? Starlord asks. So in our short story, the Guardians and Agent Venom all climb back onto their ship, and they all comment about how they feel like a million bucks and it's time for them to go find a planet to repair their ship after this whole ordeal. Rocket Raccoon has also made it Flash's job to clean up the ship, since it was his symbiote that made the mess. But before anyone can do anything else, Captain Marvel calls them up to ask Peter if he knows anything about this, because the Spartak Empire is currently broadcasting that Star-Lord is now the new president of their empire. Rocket Raccoon looks at him and he says, Hey, congrats! And I may have a few things on my record that I'm gonna need you to quietly take care of, buddy. Twelve billion years ago, an alien known as Gara was concerned that her people had reached the limit of their potential. That this was it. They could go no further in her time. But that's when the alien structure her people had worshipped granted her something. A mirror which would allow an individual to see their full, true potential. The question is, was it a gift or was it a curse? We now go to current day with Storm telling Beast, he's wrong and he knows it. He broke the laws of space and time by bringing the original five X-Men to the present from the past. And while Beast admits that it may have been wrong, he can't see the damage that he's done without seeing all of space and time. And since he'll never get to see all of space and time, he'll never know if he actually did anything wrong. But that's when Magique shows up with the young X-Men in tow. Kitty needs all of us, so let's go. She grabs both Beast and Storm, and they warp out of there. Meanwhile, in space, the Guardians are having game night, and Rocket Raccoon is cheating as the Game Master, until Peter Quill calls up the team to tell them that he needs help. He snuck onto Mr. Knife's starship with Kitty Pryde, and they discovered that Mr. Knife had gotten his hands on the Black Vortex, a gateway to infinite power. Not only that, but he was teaming up with Thane, Thanos' son. Mr. Knife, who by the way is Jason of Spartox, Star-Lord's father, was having some of his lackeys touch the mirror and they were granted amazing powers becoming his Slaughter Lords. But it's just as Thane was about to submit to its powers that Peter explains that he and Kitty jumped through the floor and they took the mirror with them. And now Star-Lord and Kitty Pryde are having everyone come to planet Spartox to the orphanage where Star-Lord helps out so that they can figure out what to do next. The X-Men, the Guardians, and various random helpers all converge to try and figure out what they should do with it. What should they do with the Black Vortex? But it ends with them deciding who will try it first. Gamora volunteers, but Storm tries to tell her no, and Bobby wants to use it to get him to grant him powers of Tony Stark, you know, money powers, or Thor's chin power. 
Even Captain Marvel argues that maybe they should use it, but Storm defiantly tells everyone, we need to destroy the Black Vortex. We can't mess with this power. That's when a booming voice behind all of them tells them, the Black Vortex is not theirs to destroy. The Slaughter Lords have arrived. Everyone jumps in ready to fight with Captain Marvel blocking the first of their attacks. And then Gamora leaps in to move towards the mirror. In the confusion of the fight, Storm asks Star-Lord where the mirror went, and Star-Lord's ship, Lydia, tells them that Gamora had it, but no one can pick her up now. That's because she's been granted cosmic powers by the Vortex. Using her new powers, she manages to dodge every attack and injure all of the Slaughter Lords, making her the champion of the fight. Seeing their chance, Storm tells the X-Men to get the heck out of there, and Jean asks if they should take the Black Vortex with them. Bobby enthusiastically says, HELL YES! Drax, on the other hand, thinks that perhaps they should smash it and aid their fellow warrior in battle. Star-Lord quickly corrects him. I think she has it, Drax. And that's because Gamora is literally dropping all of the Slaughter Lords. So Magik does her thing and she teleports everyone to the moon of Spartox along with the Black Vortex. And it ends as the Slaughter Lords have no idea where they all went. The debate finally begins again. What should they do? Storm wants to destroy the Black Vortex, but look at the power that Gamora has. Obviously, it works and it's worth it. Star-Lord takes point. All right, let's all line up and power the hell up. And that's when Kitty Pride eyeballs him. What? You want to use this? Well, yeah. We power up, stop them from powering up, and keep the Black Vortex from them. You actually want to use this on each other. I somehow got the feeling you don't think we should. Oh man, you're so gonna break up with me over this. Everyone begins to reconsider, and Captain Marvel asks, Is everything in the galaxy bad? And Drax just votes that they just let him destroy everything because he doesn't even need the Vortex. Star-Lord tries to convince Kitty that they need to do this. She doesn't understand the things in space that they deal with. And Gamora agrees with this power, she can finally end Thanos' life. But none of that matters as everyone hears a whoosh and the area fills with a blue light. Oh my stars, declares Beast as he steps out of the Vortex, a new person. He could see everything now. Space, time, the connections between them all. And he thinks, now he knows how he can fix everything. He can fix what he broke. The first thing he does is begin his calculations. And Kitty looks at him disappointed. You shouldn't have done this, Henry. Laura runs over. I've had enough of this thing. And Beast shouts, no. And the vortex hits her, knocking her back. But at that moment, Nova finally catches up. Hey guys, I made it. And then he looks around at everyone looking worried, scared, and angry. What did I miss? Gamora grabs the Vortex and sides with Beast as they show everyone their full potential. And Beast calls out to his friend, Storm, I wish you would submit. You could see the future without fear. It is within our grasp. Not everyone turns away though. Seeing his potential, Angel steps forward and he submits to the Vortex. He then walks over with Beast and Gamora and he tells them, he is free. Seeing how cool Angel got, Bobby steps up. Hell yeah, I submit. But Drax gets in the way. No. Back away from the Vortex, Oscar the Grouch. I have not begun to unleash the Grouch. Kitty confronts Beast. Remember it was your job to watch these kids, Hank? None of that matters, Kitty. But then Beast realizes the Vortex is missing. That's because Storm has grabbed it and she's making a break for it. Gomorrah jumps in, throwing her down, and the two begin to battle it out over the Vortex. But then Gomorrah stops because she sees Thanos. Beast tells her to ignore it, that it's just Jean messing with her mind. So she furiously jumps at Jean for daring to enter her mind. Kitty grabs Gamora's cape and Drax carries Jean away, then knocks Gamora out. Control yourself, he tells her. Beast grabs the Vortex though and he tells Gamora to stop. They have the Vortex and they are not responsible for those who refuse enlightenment. They are the heralds of the new dawn. Beast, Gamora, and Angel all power up and take off into space. And Star-Lord, Kitty, Captain Marvel, Nova, and the rest of the X-Men all try to think of a way to stop them. But they can't. They're too fast in this state. But that's the least of their worries as Mr. Nice Ship arrives overhead. Bobby asks if that thing is on their side and sadly, Star-Lord tells them that it isn't. Mr. Nice Ship begins to charge up and it opens fire on the moon. Meanwhile, Beast, Gamora, and Angel have all gone to another planet, a primitive one, where they are revered as gods or being so powerful to the primitive individuals there. Beast declares, it's time to change the universe, starting with this world. When suddenly, Gamora is struck from behind by a laser beam. She hits the ground hard and drops the black vortex, but as she reaches out for it, someone steps on her hand, and she looks up to see Ronan of the Kree. He smashes her into the ground and takes the black vortex. He then brings it back to his ship, and they leave the area. But Gamora knows where he is going. She knows the Kree, and she knows where they can find the Black Vortex. 
back on the moon of Spartox, everyone survived the blast thanks to Magique's powers. Realizing that Mr. Knife will be back for another round, Star-Lord yells for Magique to get them the hell out of there! So she uses the new powers that she's gained from studying with Doctor Strange, and she turns everyone invisible with the powers of Cinerock, since she can't teleport them off the moon. Then, they all load up into Star-Lord's ship and they take off into space, flipping the Slaughter Lords the bird. Once they get into space, they run into even more of their friends, Cyclops and his father who are traveling through space. The hero's side of this story has just gained a few new allies. While they're making their way through the galaxy, Gamora is leading the charge on the Kree homeworld, as all three of our overpowered heroes are destroying it, looking for the Black Vortex. They are literally destroying the city and the planet. They have no regard for life any longer. Civilians and heroes alike are burning with their wrath, and the people of Hala, the Kree homeworld, send off a distress signal. When it's received by Star-Lord, Kitty, and the rest of their team, they are also trying to figure out their plan. And at that moment, they also see a mysterious alien attacking Spartox itself and they get a distress call from the orphanage. Mr. Knife and his group are on the moon looking for Star-Lord and all of his friends. Spartox is under attack, and Gamora has declared war on Hala. Their only answer is to split into three groups. So Kitty Pride, Cyclops' father, Venom, and a few others go to Spartox to defend the orphanage. Star-Lord, Captain Marvel, Racker Raccoon, Storm, Nova, Drax, and a few others all go to Hala to save the Kree. And Cyclops goes with Bobby and Groot to distract the Slaughter Lords and Mr. Knife. But at the start of our part two, they've already failed as Mr. Knife's Slaughter Lords have already knocked all three of them unconscious and taken them prisoner. So let's follow Star Lord to Hala to stop the cosmic beings from destroying the Kree homeworld. The fight between Gamora, Beast Angel, and the Accuser Corps is interrupted by Captain Marvel, Nova, and Drax coming to their rescue, while Star Lord, Storm, and Jean all go down to speak with the Supreme Intelligence, a giant head that deems the fate of the Kree. As they walk into the main chambers, Ronan is requesting the Accuser Corps be allowed to pull back from the battle and have them all submit to the Black Vortex. But the Supreme Intelligence refuses this. His decision will stand. Star-Lord tries to butt in, informing Slimer as he puts it that this is a big mistake. Hala is engulfed by flames and they need the power of the Black Vortex if they have any hope of winning. But the Supreme Intelligence still refuses, telling them that he has 10 billion minds and he knows of the Black Vortex. They cannot use it. They currently hold the Kree fleet likelihood of survival at 32%, but if they use the Vortex, it will be a abysmal 2%. So enough of this! Leave the Vortex here, and leave the Supreme Intelligence's chambers. Meanwhile, on Spartox, Kitty Pride, Venom, and their team arrive at the Orphanage to try and see what's threatening the Orphanage, only to be introduced to their own cosmic-powered being. She explains that she is Gara, the last of the Viscardi, and she is here to destroy the Black Vortex! Now where is it?! Back with Star-Lord and Ronin, Starlet has an idea. Ronan, would you submit to the Vortex if you had a chance? Ronan gives Peter Quill a stern look. Gotcha. Well, I'm gonna go embarrass myself for a good cause, so just be ready to make your move. He runs back in shouting, I'm gonna be the king of the cosmos, baby! Black Vortex, here I come! And he jumps on it until the accusers escort him out the room, and he shouts, You'll never take me alive, accusers! But while the guards are distracted, Ronan slips back in, and he becomes Ronan of the Cosmic Powers! Meanwhile, across the galaxy, Thane, Thanos' son, has returned to his flock, his people, to find them all dead. He swears that he will have his revenge on whoever did this. And back on Hala, Gamora, Angel, and Beast are going to town, wrecking the Accuser Corps at every turn. They've stopped caring about the Black Vortex because Beast is about to complete all of his calculations of what is the space-time continuum and how he broke it. That is, until Ronan of the Accuser Corps arrives with his new power set. Seeing a potential problem, Beast calls out for them to remove Ronin before he can stop Beast's replica of space-time. Because once he finishes this device, all possibilities will be in the palm of their hands. So Gamora jumps in to battle Ronin, two overpowered individuals! Except Gamora also has a powered-up angel on her side, and she begins to burn Ronin with the fire of the Black Vortex! Until Ronin hits Angel over the head with his hammer! But it's all for nothing, as Beast's device is now complete, and he literally sees the fabric of space and time. And he sees that he broke it when he brought the young X-Men to the future. Horrified by his own actions, he rockets off into space, asking, How did I become such a monster? Seeing Beast leave, Gamora grabs Angel and they chase after him, telling Ronin, This isn't over. Ronin returns to Hala, the savior who kept the enemy away. But the Supreme Intelligence banishes him from the planet for disobeying. So Star-Lord, Captain Marvel, and Jean Grey all go back to the Supreme Intelligence to get the Black Vortex back. 
but he has no intentions of parting with it. As a matter of fact, they should be more concerned with the fact that the Earthlings have declared war on Hala. The argument begins about who started what because while their attack on Hala was wrong, they were attacking the Accuser Corps because originally they attacked them. If the Supreme Intelligence would just allow them to take the Black Vortex back, they can handle this. But once again, he refuses, and he tells them that they need to leave Hala at this moment. So, Peter Quill opens fire on the Accuser Corps, because he'll be damned if they're gonna leave without the Vortex. While Star-Lord, Captain Marvel, and Storm are fighting the Corps, Nova makes a break for it, grabbing the Vortex and flying out of the palace. Cue the Indiana Jones music, I got this, he shouts, smiling as he goes. But as he enters orbit again, he sees the massive ship of Mr. Knife right in front of him. Okay, now cue the sad Indiana Jones music. The ship blasts him hard while the Slider Lords fly in to grab the Vortex. But back on the surface of Hala, Star-Lord shouts out to his team. You know, it occurs to me now that we should have come up with a better getaway plan. Really? Captain Marvel says as she lifts an accuser off the ground. What's wrong with this one? Oh god, I'm starting to sound like Spider-Man. Then Drax helps with his wit. We are outnumbered and outpowered. If we get out of this room, we still have an entire planet to escape from. And? We are in dire straits. Drax, she knows she was being sarcastic. I do not like sarcastic. It comes down to one move from Jean, and she does something she's never done before. She pushes out a psychic overload, taking out the entire Accuser core. Meanwhile, back in space, Nova is trying to catch up to the Slaughter Lords. Not cool, not cool, not cool! He throws his boosters into overdrive and he finally begins to catch up to the Slaughter Lords, but just as he's going in to grab the Black Vortex, the Slaughter Lord stops short and he goes past it, and then he gets shot in the back, knocking off his helmet. Both he and the helmet begin to fall to the ground with Sam panicking, and up in Mr. Knight's starship, it's time for his plan to commence. All hail the mighty Kree Empire, and he begins to open fire on the entire planet! Sam catches his helmet just before he hits the ground, and he looks up to see the shots coming right at him. Oh, come on! Meanwhile, Star-Lord and everyone on the planet have made their way to the docking bay, and they're trying to take off, but there are explosions going off all around them, and Sam is screaming that he's trying to get off the planet ASAP, because the entire planet is breaking apart! Mr. Knife just destroyed the Kree homeworld! Star-Lord is pushing his ship to the limits, trying to pull out of the explosion radius, pushing it with everything! And they do it. Everyone is in shock, though. How could this happen? They lost an entire planet! But before they can really even cope with that, they ask, where is Nova in the Black Vortex? Meanwhile, Nova did manage to get away with the Black Vortex. Across the galaxy, Magic warps Rocket Raccoon onto a planet where the cosmic-powered heroes are sinning, Gamora, Beast, and Angel. Rocket walks over to them and asks Gamora if she's even in there any longer. Funny, Rocket. You are freaking me out, Gamora! You never find me funny! That's our thing! So I'm gonna go talk to the big blue furry guy. He walks over and he sees Beast in tears. Hey there, uh, Blue Earther. What the hell is wrong with you? I may have single-handedly destroyed space and time. Huh? Sucks to be you then. But while Rocket is, um, trying to help, Magic asks Gamora for help. The three of them need to work with the X-Men and the Guardians because this whole Black Vortex thing needs to stop. Then, the entire planet is hit with the force of the exploding Hala. What was that? Rocket asks. Hala. What about it? It's no longer there. It's been wiped out. Gamora turns to Magic. You have our help. We need to see if our friends are even still alive, and then find whoever did this. Meanwhile, Bobby, Cyclops, and Groot are all locked up in Mr. Knife's ship. I am Groot. This is a nightmare! Leave him alone, Bobby. I am Groot. You are annoying! As you can see, it's going very well for them. But back with Nova, once he finally wakes up, he grabs the Black Vortex and he looks into it. He sees the potential that he has. But unlike everyone else, he has a mentor he can look up to. Someone who gained ultimate power, and it destroyed him. Richard Ryder. So Nova easily turns down the power, and he takes the Black Vortex back to Earth while he figures out what he's going to do with it. He tries to call Vision from the Avengers for help, but Vision's a little busy right now. And then, the Collector arrives! He's heard of the boy who got the Black Vortex, and he would like to add these to his collection. Sam throws on his helmet and he races into space trying to avoid the Collectors. He thinks to himself that there is one place where he can probably find some friends, and that's Spartox. They left some people there. So he goes for the planet, and as he grows closer, Gara on the planet's surface with Kitty and them sense his approach, and she takes off into space to meet with him. But Nova is going so fast that he doesn't see where he's going, and he ends up on a ship as it enters Spartox's orbit. Thane's ship. And Nova just brought the Black Vortex to Thane, Thanos' son. 
Seeing the black vortex within his grasp, Thane jumps towards Nova, swinging and pushing the kid down. And then he takes the vortex and he submits to it. As Star-Lord calls up Nova to alert him that the team isn't on Spartox, Thane stands before him, cosmically powered up. I am no longer Thane, son of Thanos. He is Thanos, father of Thane! The next part of their plan is about to be enacted as Thane is about to uphold his end of the bargain by encasing the entire planet of Spartox in amber with his new power. Mr. Knife is rather excited as he has managed to steal an entire planet, because this is exactly what he wanted. Star-Lord and his team return to Spartox after all of this to find the entire orphanage and the entire planet frozen in place. Jean can read everyone's minds and they are all in a living death. Star-Lord walks over to his girlfriend, Kitty Pride, and he tries to tell her he's sorry. He didn't mean for this to happen and she's right. The Black Vortex is a curse and he regrets that they stole it from his father. This is his fault. Through the amber, a single tear can be seen on Kitty's face, and it phases through the amber to the outside of her prison. Then, with all of her might, she manages to phase through the amber and free herself. She hits the ground and Peter grabs her. Kitty, I love you! She explains that she can hear him through the amber, and using everything that she had, she was able to get out. But it's so dense, she won't be able to free anyone else. While everyone is happy that Kitty is out, they tell Venom and the kids that they'll be back for them while Nova explains that this was all Thane. He messed up and Thane has the Black Vortex. At that moment, Magique arrives and that's when everyone sees another ship arriving over Spartox, the Brood ship. Mr. Knife is offering Spartox to the Brood, an ancient insect race feared throughout the galaxy with no known origin. The Brood begin their assault on the planet by sending smaller Brood down to the surface to chew through the amber and bury eggs into the victim's heads. Beast is the one who puts it together, and he tells everyone that they need to stop this, and that's when the Slaughter Lords appear, Mr. Knife's personal, cosmically powered bodyguards. Meanwhile, Cyclops, Groot, and Iceman are all Mr. Knife's prisoners on his ship, and Cyclops is beginning to get a psychic vision of his father, telling him that it's time to get out. Using his heat vision, he can see a fingerprint on the keypad, and he opens their cells, and they run right into the enemy army. So they dive into the side room, where they find the Black Vortex is being kept. They don't have an option, and after much debating, they all decide that they will step into the Black Vortex. We now have three more heroes with cosmic powers. Cosmic Cyclops, Cosmic Groot, and Cosmic Iceman. They grab the Black Vortex and drop all of Mr. Knife's army, and they get off the ship and into space, where they see all of their friends battling against the Slaughter Lords. Captain Marvel sees them and she takes the Black Vortex, telling them that Kitty Pride has some plans for this, and they should probably join this fight. She begins to take off for Kitty, and the Slaughter Lords hit her in the back, forcing her to drop the Black Vortex, and that's when Thane flies past her, going for it, followed by Mr. Knife. They all fly at blistering speeds until Mr. Knife's floating fortress gets in the way, catching the Black Vortex and forcing Captain Marvel to crash land into it. Mr. Knife then uses his tech to make multiple versions of himself, all shooting at Captain Marvel, as she lands in front of the Black Vortex, looking at her potentially cosmically powered self. And Captain Marvel says, No! She launches into the air and manages to stop Mr. Knife just as Thane joins them on the surface. He points his power at Captain Marvel, attempting to encase her in amber, but she grabs the Black Vortex and uses it to reflect his power back at him, aiming it at Mr. Knife, sealing him in the amber. To make things even more interesting, Gara, a cosmically powered alien who's been chasing the Black Vortex, lands right in front of both Thane and Captain Marvel. With a single movement of her hand, she throws Thane into space, and Captain Marvel says, screw this, as she launches back into space. She flies as fast as she can back to the surface of Spartox, where Kitty, Star-Lord, and all of the non-space flying heroes are, followed by Gara demanding the Black Vortex. She then hits everyone with her power, throwing the Black Vortex off yet again, and this time it lands in front of a young Jean Grey. She looks at it knowing that she'll need to save everyone, and she prepares to submit to its power even if it means losing herself and possibly becoming a villain again, just like the previous Jean Grey did with the Phoenix, until Star-Lord stops her. Jean, it doesn't have to be you this time. Then Star-Lord looks into it and he sees his potential, his future, and it would force him to lose Kitty Pride. He can't do it, he turns away from it as well. Gara walks over to the Black Vortex and tells everyone to look on and see. She shows them her planet, the one she herself killed in her greed, and she tells them that she needs to destroy the Black Vortex to prevent this from happening again. Kitty pleads with her though, they need it to save Spartox, and Gara asks her, would you save Spartox at the expense of another planet? 
Imagine what having the Black Vortex around could do to the entire galaxy. Imagine what would happen if one of you became crazy with power. Who is strong enough to submit to the Black Vortex and keep it under control? Kitty Pride is the one who steps up. It has to be me. I hate space. I don't want cosmic powers. This is so not my jam. I'm the last person who wants to do this, so it has to be me. Gara tells her to step forward and Star-Lord runs over. Kitty, no! She apologizes. She has to. With the planet of Spartox in Amber, and with her friends battling against the Slaughter Lords, and with a cosmic being willing to destroy the Black Vortex in front of her, Kitty Pride steps up and submits. She sees all of the possible Kitty Prides throughout each generation in multiverse, all of the possibilities and the things that will never be. She sees power even the other cosmic beings don't understand. And while she's coping with all of this knowledge, in the battle with the Slaughter Lords, a cosmically powered Ronin shows up, and he needs his revenge for them destroying his home world. He demands that all be judged for their actions. While this is happening, Kitty Pride reaches out and grabs the planet of Spartox, and she begins to phase the entire world out of existence, removing it from its amber prison. Star-Lord smiles as he realizes the girl that he loves just resisted the power of the Black Vortex, and everyone on the planet is happy to be out of their amber prisons. Everyone is now on the planet Spartox, looking at the Black Vortex. Half the team is currently cosmically powered, and the other half denied the power of the Cosmics. And Gara offers them one last thing, a way out. They can give up their powers and go back to normal. She warns them though, the Celestials may come looking for them one day and the Vortex will not completely change them back. No one can walk away completely unchanged. Iceman, Groot, and Cyclops all come to an easy decision to change back to normal. Gamora considers anyone wanting to change back to be a fool and she wishes to stay this way and Angel agrees with her. Beast decided to change back so that he can work towards what he broke in the time stream and so, they are changed back. Groot and Bobby get a complete makeover and they look better, but Cyclops goes back to the way he once was. Jean reads his mind and can tell the Vortex changed his heart. And Kitty, well, she kept her powers. With that, Gara took the Black Vortex and she headed off to parts unknown to dispose of it alone while everyone loaded back up on the Guardian's ship to head back to Earth. As they all returned, Kitty and Star-Lord took a moment to discuss their lives and what the heck just happened. They love each other and they trust each other. So Star-Lord asks Kitty Pride, will she marry him? Meanwhile, the Collector picked up and decided to keep Mr. Knife locked in his amber for the collection. And Ronan swore his vengeance as his world was still destroyed. And Thane wants to find the Black Vortex so that he could once again rule the galaxy. With everyone pressing their faces against the glass of the Guardian ship, they can see that Star-Lord and Kitty are embracing and they all cheer. There's a wedding coming, the end. The Negative Zone, a place where the kings and queens of the galaxy secretly meet. But now, there is only Annihilus and the Queen of the Brood. Queen of the Brood wonders where the others are, but Annihilus explains. King Jason was removed from his throne. The supreme intelligence of the Kree was destroyed along with his planet. Gladiator of the Shi'ar has been ignoring their invitations, and he will never trust the Shintari. But back in the Milky Way galaxy, Ben Grimm is flying through space holding onto a tiny jetpack that would fit the size of a certain raccoon. But you know what? Grimm decides that this feels right. Ben thinks to himself how much he needed this. This is what his original goal in life was. To be a spaceman. Except one thing. The giant Shatari spacecraft that's trying to eat him. But before the Shintari can blast Ben for stealing something from them, Ben is rescued by the rest of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Kitty Pride asks Star-Lord, Drax, Rocket Raccoon, Groot, and Venom. Rocket complains that Ben took the only good rocket pack and the Guardians notice the giant Shintari ship. We gonna do the thing? Rocket says to Kitty. Let's do the thing, she responds. Using the rockets on her feet, Kitty begins to skate through the forces gathering around them and destroying them, then finally going through the giant ship in the middle, causing a massive explosion. Venom asks, if Kitty can phase through things and disrupt their technology, why doesn't she phase out of her clothes? And Rocket responds, hey, you're covered in alien goo and I don't ask why. To your face. Drax likes the new warrior. And Rocket likes the new Star-Lord, but Drax wonders how the old one is doing. Back on planet Spartox, Peter Quill is the new king of Spartox, and it is very, very boring. Peter decides to get up and leave, but doesn't really have a good reason to go, so when they ask him why he's leaving, he's forced to sit back down. Back in the Guardian ship, Rocket wanted to open that thing that Ben stole from the Shintari, but they aren't sure if they should open it because, you know, it might
might be a bomb. It's not a bomb. I am Groot. Exactly. Maybe it's just a cake. Drax tells them that they should bring it to an expert. An expert that they can trust. And Rocket responds with, we don't know any. And Ben asks, experts? No, people that we can trust. Kitty suggests taking it to someone, but Rocket isn't getting it. Then he realizes, no! Kitty pushes further and the crew travels to Spartox to meet up with Peter, who is currently being groped by a tall pink alien. The alien is trying to tell Peter that they should procreate. It'll build a new reputation, but Peter isn't really wanting any of that. And that's when the ship flies in right next to them. Who are those creatures? The alien asks, and Peter responds with, uh, that's the Guardians of the Galaxy and my fiance. But as the crew gets out to give Peter what Ben stole, the guards point out that they were followed. No, we weren't. I have a special hyperdrive that, uh-oh. Everyone turns to the sky to see a ball of fire falling and crashing through the buildings to the ground. Everyone runs over to see what happened, but Peter already thinks he knows what or who this is. It's Gamora. She's badly hurt and bleeding, but is able to tell them, the destroyer of the worlds is here. Hala is here to destroy you. She begins to tell the story of the Kree homeworld. They were the most advanced civilization in the universe. The Kree's power stretched across the galaxy and saved worlds from cosmic threats. The Kree helped the galaxy keep order, and the homeworld of the Kree was destroyed. She is the accuser, the last of the Kree, destroyed by the guardians of the galaxy, and it is time for them to atone. Hala slams her weapon down, causing a massive explosion, knocking everyone down, and Kitty tries to face through Hala, but it isn't hurting her. Peter can't understand what Hala is trying to say, but that's when Rocket has an idea as to why she's here to kill them. Remember when we narrowly escaped the destruction of the Kree homeworld? And Peter tells Rocket, oh man. Drax calls out the accuser, stating that she needs to stop or feel the wrath of the Guardians. But Ben steps in, telling him that he has a different saying back on Earth. It's clobbering time! Ben yells as he runs in to punch Hala, while Kitty just looks at him going, I knew you were gonna say that. I don't like kidding abroad, but Kitty responds back, don't be sexist, but she's gonna kill us. No, calling her abroad. So calling her abroad is sexist, but hitting her isn't? But while Peter argues with the guards to get medical assistance for Groot and Gamora, because the guards aren't really sure how to treat a tree. Drax picks up Hala's weapon, and it suddenly causes a giant blast knocking everyone out. Peter's guards begin to shoot the weapon out of Drax's hands, and Hala begins to stand up reaching for her weapon. And then with one final blast covering the entire area around her, Hala picks up the lifeless Peter and tells him that he is accused, and he is found guilty. Eye for an eye, planet for a planet. But because you are half Spartox and half Earther, your punishment will be both of your homeworlds. Peter starts to wake up and he notices that he's in a pod ship. And then when he turns, he can see Spartox and it's slowly being destroyed. Over in a marketplace over on Nowhere, there is a place called Fronta's House of Self-Defensory. Inside this shop is Fronta promptly telling somebody that they should get the Flark out of his shop. That's when we see the large man that he's talking to, Yotat, the destroyer of destroyers. And he is looking for Drax, the destroyer. Yotat is wanting information from Fronta because he sold weapons to Drax and he wants to know where Drax went. Fronta tells him that he doesn't know where he is. He just sells weapons of all kinds to all kinds of species. They just come and go. But before Yotat leans in, one of his lackeys tells him to look at something. Spartox is under attack by Hala. Peter Quill is out. Fronta tells them there, that's where your guardians are, now go. Yotat turns back to Fronta telling him that he's been no help and then literally knocks his head off. Before leaving though, Yotat is stopped by a creature of the brood and their queen because they would like a word with Yotat. Back in Spartak's orbit, Peter is screaming for help, but this is just a pod ship. There are no communications and he realizes he's just talking to himself. However, back on Spartak's royal court, Hala is killing all of the royal guards, even jumping through a battleship and easily taking it down. Kitty starts to come to and she notices is that she's not being watched as she starts to phase the rest of the Guardians to an underground passage. Rocket then locates that Peter is in orbit and the team decides that they need to climb back up to the surface to escape. Rocket begins repairing the wires on the ship while Venom covers him. Once Rocket finishes and everyone gets inside, Ben notices a rather large and humongous problem. They need seatbelts. So Rocket tells them, grow up here. The Guardians begin to take off when Hala sees them and she begins to chase them. As Ben is getting ready to slow her down, Gamora stands ready telling them she is mine. And she jumps from the ship ready to fight Hala again. However, Gamora is still weak from being knocked down to the planet, so she ends up just giving everyone enough time to activate the ship's cloak and escape. Hala knows that they are going to go get Peter, and she realizes that she's too late to stop them. Once they get everyone back in the Guardian ship, Peter wants to go back down to get Gamora, but Rocket argues that they need a plan. While everyone is yelling, Ben asks if they actually did blow up Hala's planet when everyone turns to him to yell, NO! However, Peter is hard on himself, and he's taking the blame, as it was his father, Jason, that destroyed it, and he wasn't able to stop him. 
Peter wants to go back to Spartox, but Rocket refuses until they have an actual plan. Then everyone looks at Rocket and Peter tells him, turn the ship around. Back on Spartox, Hala continues to beat down on Gamora, asking where Peter went. But before Gamora can answer anything, Peter tells her, I'm right here. Peter tries to explain that it wasn't them who destroyed her planet, it was his father, Jason. Hala begins to understand that the old King Jason was responsible for the destruction of her planet, and that Peter is just his son. However, she tells him that her goals still remain unchanged. Rocket tells everyone, I told you that was what she was gonna say. No one listens to me. Peter calls out to Kitty and she phases through the ground under Hala, pulling her down and locking her into the ground. Drax punches Hala so hard that he knocks her helmet off, and that's when she notices something. Looking up, she can see Ben flying straight down on her. He lands on top of her, causing a giant explosion, throwing everyone back, and then he just sits there over the knocked out Hala. Everyone gathers around Drax as he holds Gamora to find out if she's still alive. Peter is shocked to see that Gamora actually fought for him. He thought she hated him. She still does, but not that much. Venom tells Ben that he can relax as he's holding Hala, ready to punch her again. Pretty sure we won. But to be safe, Venom breaks Hala's glaive. Peter begins to thank the crew for helping even after what they've all been through and Kitty understands. Let's fix your planet and then we can. But that's when Kitty is cut off. Fix it? I was hoping to watch it burn. And that's when everyone turns to see Yotat and he begins telling everyone who he is. I am Yotat, destroyer of destroyers. But before he can finish, Rocket points his rifle. Hey, we're in the middle of something, so you're dead. Blam, blam, blam. Rocket tells everyone that they can go back to the original plan when they all look at him. Please don't tell me. And Yotat is standing there, continuing and finishing his monologue before he begins opening fire on everyone and destroying Groot. With everyone knocked out, Yotat reaches down to grab Drax by the head. Drax, I give you a warrior's death. I want Quill to watch. I want the galaxy to see this. Please don't, don't do this, Peter. Peter calls out. King Quill, are you begging? I didn't think the Spartox knew how to beg. My actual world is falling apart because of the accuser. These people need our help, Peter tells him. Do you have any more begging or can I pull off your friend's head? No, that's all the time we needed. Then Venom crawls out from behind and he grabs Yotat. Rocket then stands up with his homemade weapon, all charged and recalibrated, going, Big Boom! Anywhere in particular? Rocket asks Peter. On the face, please. So Venom lets go and Rocket yells, Boom! Big Boom! Blasting Yotat. And sincerely, wholeheartedly, and Completely. I hope I just murdered you. Let's make sure this guy is down then. No, Drax says, interrupting Peter. I have this. Help the innocent. Rocket looks down to see pieces of Groot. Aw, oh, Groot, can you hold it together? You missed me blowing the Glenards off that guy. Drax comes in, unleashing a powerful punch right into Yotat's face. Everyone is helping the civilians get to safety as the fight goes on. Drax keeps punching Yotat, grabbing him by the face, and he slams him down, punching him over and over. But as Yotat gets up ready to smash Drax with his gun, Ben interrupts him, knocking him down. Drax then continues beating Yotat until help finally arrives. But Peter turns and asks Kitty who that guy even was. Oh, Yotat? Yeah, we met him while you were busy being king. Funny story, actually. Kitty begins to explain that back on Nowhere, the crew stopped off to get supplies and show Ben around when they saw Yotat hurting someone as he was trying to extort money from them. Kitty phased and rescued the person, and Drax kicked him in the back, and Rocket shot a rocket at him. But before Yotat could react, the Nowhere Corps showed up, and a talking dog arrested him. And that's when Yotat swore that he would kill them all. Now with the flashback over, Ben yells, it's clobberin' time, as Ben and Drax give Yotat one final attack. With Ben's arm around Drax, Drax tells Ben that he's not a fan of his war crime. And Ben tells him, it'll grow on ya. Peter tells the guards to incarcerate this Yotat asshat and double incarcerate the Kree accuser who, um, you phased her through solid ground, Kitty, Peter says. I did, and it didn't kill her. No, Peter looks back at Kitty. She's badass. And more to the point, she's on the loose. Kitty says, crap! However, Hala doesn't get very far as she falls to the ground below and is quickly subdued while Peter is telling the guards to find her. Peter kneels down to get Gamora because she's barely alive, and Peter calls for the medics. Soon Gamora is in the hospital recovering along with a small little group plant next to her. But back at Peter's council, he argues not to release Hala back to whatever is left of the Kree Empire, as she is a threat to both Spartox and Earth. But the council has already agreed on releasing her. I thought I ran things around here, Peter says, but everyone gets quiet. I think they had a vote without you, Kitty says, as the guards begin to grab Peter. This council the council is holding you accountable for the attacks on our planet. The council members begin to say, You jerks set me up! Ironically, I was about to quit this job, but at least I had the courtesy to wait. Honey, it's time to go. Kitty says that she begins phasing Peter and herself through the floors. And that's when another council member tells everyone, let them run. They can go from one side of the galaxy to the other, but Quill and the Guardians are now enemies of the galaxy. With Peter now the head of the Guardians of the Galaxy again, and the Guardians trying to make their escape from Spartax, this is where it ends. But back at the Negative Zone, Annihilus congratulates the Brood Queen for having the Spartax Council remove their king. Annihilus sits back. Now is time to make our move. But we must not repeat the mistakes of the past, the Brood Queen hisses. What did you have in mind?
Currently, Peter Quill and Kitty Pride find themselves in what Kitty calls the subterranean poop hole of the Badoon prison planet outpost, and Peter is still blaming himself for what happened to Spartox. Kitty asks, What's wrong? Are you hurt? Because if not, then we should probably get moving. We are being looked for. Can't you deal with this later? But Peter just sits there, telling her that he lost a planet. She looks at him and asks, Are you really doing this right now? I asked you if we could talk about this 10 times before in much safer places. Right now, we don't have the time. We have to do this later, Peter. She then leans over and tells him that he hasn't even commented on her new look. To which Peter says, No, absolutely no. No to the outfit or no to commenting? Do you think this is my first trip around the Andromeda Strand? No. To your trap, no. I would rather talk to Thanos about his moisturizing regimen than talk about your clothes. Like you dress so great. Pro tip, neither blue nor Indiana Jones is your color, Peter. As the two continue to go back and forth, Kitty begins to wonder how it is that she's been a superhero since the age of 13, but this entire time since then, she has never been able to pull off a look. So you hate what you're wearing too, Kitty. Peter stops and asks if they're really fighting about this, but Kitty tells him, of course not. I just need you to be ready now. Peter asks if she wore that horrible outfit to snap him out of his funk. She tells him, it worked, right? The two begin to make their way across the tunnels when they happen to come across some guards looking for them. And Peter says, psst. And Kitty tells him, no, no, psst. Soon the guards turn around and then they end up shooting the guards with Peter arguing the fact that they totally had that. More guards begin to show up and Peter and Kitty quickly begin to stop them and begin to escape again. But after a short run, they find themselves surrounded by an exceptionally large guard. Peter suggests that they should probably run and Kitty tells him to hang on. She's thinking maybe the guards can take them where they need to go. Peter explains that there's no way that they would do that, and she says that she's been a hero since age 13. She knows when to run and when to do the other thing. Peter begins to open his mouth to the big guard, but before he can finish his sentence, the guard punches Peter in the face with a booming crack. Kitty manages to phase out and get Peter away and tells him that that went poorly, but at least he's knocked out, so he can't rub it in that she was wrong. He begins to wake up, telling her, I'm awake. And how long have you been a superhero again? As Peter begins to get back up, he's then spotted by a patrolling guard and he begins to make a break for it again. But as they begin to get away, Kitty states that maybe they should find out how they came here to get in. Before she can finish her sentence, she sees all of the other aliens. She begins to walk through the settlement of prisoners after seeing an alien holding a lifeless child. She tells Peter, give her the gun. He tells her to stick to the plan, but Kitty says, the plan sucks, give me your gun. He asks what she's gonna do with it and through her tears, she yells, She's gonna shut this down, this entire concentration camp. After taking the gun, Kitty jumps up and begins to face through the buildings, destroying them, and that's when the guards begin to fly in. Kitty knocks them out, giving Peter a vehicle to fly, and then she continues to destroy things by phasing through them. Peter tries to tell the prisoners to go on, get out of there, but that's when one of the prisoners stops him and tells him that he saved their lives. He's a hero to these people. Peter tells him no, but uh, you could tell me where you keep the high risk political prisoners. Prisoners tell him that it was an honor to have met him. And Peter tells them that really doesn't help. And then Peter stops when he sees the giant guard. The guard pulls his fist back and he punches Peter to the ground. And then he opens up his eyes to see a Badoon sentencing him for crimes against their brotherhood and sisterhood. They find his existence an abomination to their people and he is now sentenced to death. Off on another planet, Rocket walks in cuffs as some bad Dune is walking him onto the planet. While they're talking in their own language, Rocket shouts at them, stating that it's rude to talk and spit. Everyone in the universe knows that spitting is glock and rude. But you know what? What you don't know is that I've been stalling for time. So if you would, could you look up now? When they look up, they see a figure heading towards the ground, and then the figure hits the ground, causing an explosion, sending everyone flying back. Rocket shouts, Say yet! Say yet, you magnificent piece of orange glorkin! Through the wreckage, Ben Grimm stands up stating, It's clobbering time, baby! Rocket jumps on him, telling him, You did amazing! But you did miss the big one! Ben looks back and he sees a large guard walking towards them, stating, Of course I missed the big one! There's always a big one! The Badoon jumps towards Ben, and Ben jumps towards the Badoon, and the two of them punch each other right in the face! He then begins to beat down the Badoon, asking if that was it, because I thought that there would be more! Rocket looks towards the ship, stating, Well, that's just great! You knocked over our getaway ship! Guess I'll just have to go about fixing it! And while Ben goes to push the ship back over, he notices a rather attractive alien. Ah, uh, hey there, name's Ben, I'm a guardian of the galaxy. Also, used to be in the Fantastic Four, kind of a big deal. The alien says something, but Ben can't quite understand it because it's in the alien's language, and another alien translates that she's stating that she didn't understand anything he just said. While Ben begins to flirt with the alien, more Badoon appear ready to attack. So Ben tells the alien, hold on a second, and he begins to beat down on everyone, telling them that I was busy talking! 
More guards begin to appear and they all begin to open fire on Ben. And that's when a rocket jumps in shooting and shouting, yeah, he's right. You can't even finish a thought around here. The two continue to take down the Badoon forces, but as the aliens try to get away, another large Badoon steps in front of the female alien. She closes her eyes, bracing for what's about to come next. But when she opens her eyes, she sees the Badoon has fallen over, and Ben Grimm is standing there with a gun. He helps her up, telling everyone that they need to hurry and get off this planet. And that's when another ship lands in front of them. Rocket pokes his head out, telling everyone, all aboard! And that's when all of the aliens begin to get onto the ship. Once on board, Ben checks to make sure that no one is left behind. And that's when the female alien grabs Ben and hugs him as their head touches a blinding blue light begins to swirl around and rocket asks what's going on back there and ben tells him i uh i think we just got married rocket shouts mazel tov at least that's what kitty says you know i'm really overdoing meeting someone special too just as rocket is about to take off he receives a transmission and when they pull it up they see the badoon sentencing peter quill to death glorious quill got himself caught Earlier, back out of nowhere, you're probably wondering where all of this started. How did they even get involved on this planet to begin with? Well, the Guardians all sit around for lunch while Gamora informs everyone that they've located her. The person that they're looking for is currently located on a prison planet in the Bacilla Quadrant under Badoon control. Kitty asks, what does she do to end up on a prison planet run by those asshats? And Gamora says they defied them time and time again. They are their enemy. Kitty says, you are? That was before my time with you. And Gamora tells her, well, you're with us now. So you're their enemy as well. Kitty doesn't see how that's really fair. Peter begins to speak up, stating that they do have to go get her. And Flash Thompson, also known as Venom, asks, who are we getting? Can't we get help? And Peter says, yeah, but there's no one to call. Kitty says that it's right, so them against a planet. And Peter asks, how are we going to do that? So Gamora tells them that they'll split up. Kitty and Peter both repeat the sentence. Oh they split up. Later, once they all get into position, Flash and the now-infused Groot jump off of Peter's ship down towards the planet. Groot watches as Peter and Kitty jump as well, and he keeps saying, I am Groot! I am Groot! I am! Once they land, Flash says that their landing was a bit off, so they're gonna have to walk it, and it shouldn't be too far. They just need to not be out in the open, and that's when they hear a snap. And they look up to see scrolls. Flash shouts that he's been waiting for this and he jumps into attack. But Groot stops him, telling him, I am Groot. Flash tries to fight through Groot, but one of the scroll steps forward, stating, I speak your Earth language. Flash again tries to shoot a spike towards the scroll, but Groot catches it and points off for him to look. Groot shows him that the scrolls are prisoners. They are not the enemy. Flash tells him, well, fine. But the thing is, these scrolls tried to take over Earth. And from the looks of it, their shape is looking a bit outdated. How about they change into something more like a modern line Avenger? The scrolls tell him that they can no longer shapeshift, that Badoon took that from them. Once the Annihilation Wave destroyed their planet, they searched for a new place to start the Scroll Empire. But that was when the Badoon attacked and captured the scrolls. Groot smiles, but Flash simply says, first the scrolls tried to steal Earth, then they tried to steal me, and now you want me to rescue them, and I'm the asshole of this story? One of the scrolls points up stating, they are coming, our masters are coming. Everyone looks up to see several ships flying down towards them. And soon many Badoon begin jumping off firing their guns at them. Flash and Groot begin to fight with them and soon the scrolls jump in to help. Groot starts with the roar cry, I am Groot. And Flash tells him, yeah, you tell him. As the dust begins to settle and the last Badoon is defeated, Flash tells him that it's time for them to leave. And one of the scrolls asks if he means all of them. Flash asks, well, exactly how many of you are there? The scroll begins to lead Flash and Groot into a cave, and he tells them to adjust their eyes. Groot holds up a light, and Flash sees that the cave is filled with scrolls. And he tells them, Okay, let's go, every single one of you. Over in the Dreisten Tower, the Warden's High Tower, the Warden begins to panic due to the fact that these Guardians of the Galaxy have single-handedly invaded their planet. An entire planet! It's fine, though. He just has to think of a plan before this becomes a further embarrassment to the Brotherhood. They need to. But before he can finish the sentence, a giant explosion goes off and the Warden asks, What is happening? His men and him look up to see a small ship flying towards them and out Drax and Gamora come jumping. Drax says that, I needed this. And he begins slaughtering all of the Badoon. And then he grabs the Warden demanding to know, Are you the one who's in charge? While Drax is trying to figure out where they put her, Gamora begins her assault, but soon is stomped by one of the larger Badoons as she's knocked off the side of the building. Soon Gamora begins to wake up, finding herself in chains, and the Badoon in front of her tells her that she is now a prisoner, and he is here to extract the truth from her. They would like to very much know how it is that Gamora and her friends have found out that she is here. Gamora asks if she's alive. And the interrogating Badoon tells her, Yes, ironically, she was here in the same facility. However, you will never see her. Gamora asks, Why? And the interrogating Badoon tells her that her power is unique. We need more unique power sources to reach our goals. But there is something else that the Badoon would like to know. 
Just where is Thanos? It's as if he's hiding. He then pushes a needle close to Gamora's eye, and she stops him, asking if he knows what the Black Vortex is. He stops and tells her, of course I do. The Kree lost their homeworld over it. Do you know where that is? She tells him. She touched it, and she's been using it to hunt down Thanos. There was a problem. Every time she used it, the power started to fade a little. So she's been saving the last little bit for a special occasion. Soon the room begins to fill with light and Gamora breaks out of her chains. The power begins to spread as soon a massive explosion goes off, launching bodies out of the room. Gamora then walks out asking one of the guards, where is she? The guard points over and with a flick of her arm, Gamora slices through the guard. She then walks over to the cell the guard pointed out, blows open the door, asking if she can stand. Angela tells her that if she's here to rescue her, she accepts. The light begins to fade from Gamora's eye. She tells the Black Vortex goodbye. They need to hurry out of here. Angela says that she could use a cleaning first, and then a voice calls out to her. When the two girls look back, they see Drax stating, I found your things, so we can leave now. While Angela suits up, Drax tells Gamora that the Brotherhood has taken Quill. As Angela finishes getting ready, she tells them, then we will go rescue him and destroy this entire empire of blood once and for all. Over on the home planet of the Brotherhood of Badoon, Peter stands trial because he's told because of his crimes, he's gonna be sentenced to death. He says that it's a real bummer personally. So are they gonna talk him to death? One of the guards kicks Peter off of the ledge down to an arena filled with other Badoon getting ready to fight. As the leader begins to watch, a Badoon appears telling him that he needs to have a word with him. It's about the Guardians of the Galaxy. They escaped. The leader looks back and asks how many people were stationed on that planet. And the Badoon tells him, hundreds of thousands. He then asks how many of the Guardians of the Galaxy were there. And the Badoon tells him, it fluctuates, but five were there. The leader looks back and he shouts, and we have their leader? Down in the arena, Peter shouts, step into a slip, Jim! And he begins to drop the Badoon. The leader begins to hold his head, asking, how could this happen? And Peter shouts, I don't mind dying, but could you at least pay attention to me dying? So the leader starts to give out some orders, but that's when a hand reaches through his chest and Kitty whispers to him, hi, I'm Kitty Pride, and I just phased my whole arm through you. It's a thing that I do. I'm gonna pull my arm back, pulling out whatever I can grab, unless you all surrender and shut this whole thing down. The leader says that they won't surrender, and that's when Kitty pulls her arm back, taking his heart out of his chest. Maybe? Ew, what is this? The guards begin to fire at Kitty and she asks if they miss the part about phasing through things. Down in the arena, Peter begins to shout, yes! Holding his arms up while the rest of the Guardians of the Galaxy begin to jump down from their ship. Rocket tells Peter, settle down! And Flash tells everyone else to hurry before Peter loses any more of his clothes. He's gonna be naked down there. Everyone begins destroying the Badoon forces and Angela thanks Kitty for saving their leader for her. She's eternally grateful. As explosions go off, Rocket throws Peter his guns and tells him to be useful for once. Peter shouts back at him, telling him, shut up, I'm having the time of my life down here. And Rocket tells him, well, you got me there. So on their search for Angela, the Guardians kind of took a detour, liberating prisoners and slaves from all over the galaxy. And it didn't really take much to motivate them to fight back. As the battle continues now with all these slaves and prisoners fighting with them, Peter mentions that they should probably go on and get out of here before things get any uglier. They just can't beat up an entire species. And that's when the voice of Angela calls out to everyone to hear her. She stands with the head of the Brotherhood leader, telling them that their days of slavery and terrorizing are over. They will fix what they have done or she will destroy them all. Peter states that he thinks the fight is over, and Rocket says, I'll go get the ship. While the crew gets back on their ship and they begin to celebrate, Flash calls Peter over to see something. And everyone begins to pile into the communications room to see a broadcast from Captain Marvel. She tells them that if they're not busy, she could really use their help back on Earth. Peter asks what's going on, and she tells him, well, it's Tony Stark. He's gone off the rails. And that's how the Guardians of the Galaxy got back to Earth for Civil War. Ben Grimm dreams of the girl that he left behind on the planet, the one who seemed to adore him yet he didn't understand a single word from her and somehow they apparently became space married, they hit the road in a manner of speaking until they got a call from Captain Marvel. She told them that there was an issue on Earth that she would like them to return for. If you've been missing it on Earth, there was an inhuman discovered who can see the future. Captain Marvel wants to use these visions to arrest people before they can act, while Tony Stark wants to run more tests and figure out a different plan. This has led to a battle between the heroes known as Civil War II, and there's an entire video focusing on that storyline alone. But knowing that she would need some backup, Captain Marvel called on her friends. The team puts it to a vote as not everyone wants to return to Earth. Angela votes that they return, and Peter Quill votes it as well. Drax says that he's ambivalent, and Groot says, I am Groot. Gamora raises her hand while Rocket is growling, and so does Kitty. And Flash Thompson leans in to vote yes, while Ben Grimm tells everyone, just great. 
So if I vote no, I'm the jerk. They ask him why he left anyway, and he tells them, one of the reasons was because I didn't want to be involved in any more superhero fighting. And Kitty asks him what the other reason was, as he sadly walks away. I'm gonna get a snoozer. Wake me when we get back to Earth. Everyone prepares for their journey back to Earth in their own ways, such as Kitty and Peter spending alone time together and Gamora meditating. But in the end, Rocket reports that they have arrived and BOOM they take a hit! Everyone looks out the window to see Carol Danvers is about to slam the ship into oblivion! And Peter calls out, Carol, you called us! She smiles sheepishly, telling them that she's sorry. They get to meet Alpha Flight and Peter heads off to talk to Carol, where he discovers the horrible truth of everything that has happened. Carol explains how they found an inhuman that can see the future. Peter then takes his information to Kitty where he explains what happened. They found an inhuman that could see the future and he got a vision of Thanos coming to Earth. So Carol took the Ultimates up to battle against him and in the fight, James Rhodes, also known as War Machine, died and She-Hulk was critically injured. James Rhodes was Carol's boyfriend and Tony Stark's best friend, which is why they are fighting about what to do with the inhuman now. But the thing is, Thanos is still on Earth. Kitty reels back from this news. The same Thanos that Drax and Gamora are always talking about? Yeah. The same Thanos that is Gamora's adopted father? I do believe that there's only one Thanos, Kitty. The same Thanos that Gamora has been looking all over the galaxy for? Yeah. Where is Thanos now? Danvers didn't say. We have to tell Gamora. She'll be thrilled! And Peter looks away. Peter, you have to tell Gamora. She won't be thrilled, Kitty. You have to tell her, Peter! Go right now and tell her! You don't understand, Kitty. Thanos does something to her. Every time that she's gotten to him, he gets in her head and he escapes. People. Friends have died trying to help her. What if this once, just this once, we think about her actions and not tell her? But what will we do if Gamora finds out that we didn't tell her? Yeah. The Guardians get into position where they begin to realize what they're doing. They're siding with Carol Danvers because she's their friend, but do they actually believe in this cause? Do they believe in profiling individuals based on future predictions? Gamora tells them that if she has any chance of preventing Thanos before it can happen, then it is a good thing. But as they debate everything, sitting up above the world in a spaceship, the superheroes all gather as tensions have brought the fight to its peak. And since the Guardians have a cloaking device on, no one can even tell that they're there. Ben Grimm looks down, seeing the obvious stuff that has changed while he was gone, such as two Captain Americas and two Iron People. While they all sit there itching to join the fight, Carol radios up to wait for her signal. Everyone puts on their masks and they get their weapons ready. In an epic fashion, Carol tells Tony that he's under arrest and not to worry about her numbers. She has friends. The Guardians all leap out of their spaceship, ready to fight this out! The fight was intense and many people were injured. But this comic does not tell us the story of this fight. The Civil War II comic did. If you want to know about the fight, you just have to watch that video or read that series. But for those of you who don't care. 14 minutes later, Rocket almost cried as the Guardian ship was destroyed. And 36 minutes later, the battle ended. Peter told Rocket that it sucked that he lost his ship and Rocket was stunned. He put everything he had into that ship. Everything that all of the Guardians owned was there. Carol didn't seem to care, and that just made Rocket even matter. So eventually he went to go have a seat, while Peter pulled Carol aside to tell her that she was right. But that isn't the worst thing that came out of this fight. One of the soldiers came over to ask for a report. He wanted to know if Thanos was still locked in the basement. Gamora overheard him. She walked into the basement without hesitation, and she demanded to be let in, and the guards told her to turn around. So she dropped them all, demanding to know where he is. She continued to battle them until Carol stopped her, calling out to Gamora, asking, How dare you? And she looked up at Carol. You have Thanos here? I'm not doing this here. Where is he, Marvel? Gamora. Where is my father? Carol didn't answer her, so Gamora stood up and began to walk away. Carol reached out for her, and the two of them fought for a few moves before Carol used her power to stop Gamora. Peter tried to warn Carol, but she told him to back off as she has this. She grabbed Gamora, and she rocketed out of the building and into the limits of space with Gamora demanding that she let her go. And after landing a punch, Carol told her okay, and she dropped her. She fell from the highest point into the ocean, where Carol floated nearby telling her to calm down, and Gamora demanded to know why she didn't tell her. The fight continued until Carol stood up and told her, this is why I didn't tell you exactly what you're doing right now. Everyone knows that you're this perfect warrior except when it comes to Thanos. This is what he does to you. And then Carol put her hands to her face. Quill was right. I should have just told you. And that, my listeners, is how this got worse. Because Gamora turned to her asking, Quill knew? She kicked Carol back and told her not to look for her. And she fled the area. News got back to the rest of the Guardians quickly. Peter Quill knew Thanos was here and he didn't tell any of them. They were a team. No, they were more than a team. They were family. Rocket of all couldn't believe that he lied, and he walked off, and Drax simply left without a word. Thus, the Guardians of the Galaxy were disbanded, all because of Civil War II.
Gamora looks over the city that is her objective. Her father is Thanos, and her mission has been to kill him. And Peter Quill neglected to tell her where he was being held. She looks at the most secure building on the planet, the S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters, the prison of Thanos from a distance. She knows what she has to do, and she's going to do it alone. Alpha Flight members arrive to talk her down as she simply looks at them. Earth soldiers, do not force my hand. And they respond by telling the greatest assassin in the universe to surrender. Gamora jumps right at them, deflecting a shot into Sasquatch, and then she kicks Aurora in the face before America gets a shot in, drawing blood from her, throwing her into the rooftop. Spectrum then opens fire, trying to bury her, and Gamora takes the full blast. America then turns to Spectrum, asking if she was trying to kill her, and Spectrum tells her that she hopes not. She's a fan of Gamora. Luckily, Gamora snaps out of it and throws America aside before leaping back in to continue the conflict. She deflects Aurora's blast again, slicing at Sasquatch, and deflects Spectrum's shot back at Aurora removing her. And as she falls to the streets down below, Alpha Flight runs over to see where she landed, but they can't find her anywhere. She slipped into a little boy's room telling him, shh, and then she walks through his house quietly, heading for the front door. Except America sucker punched her through the door, through the house, and into the parents' bedroom. With that, Gamora was captured and restrained. When she woke up, she found herself face to face with Captain Marvel, her friend and the one who had locked up Thanos and didn't tell her. Captain Marvel explains that they didn't tell her because he's her father. She didn't want to hurt Gamora, nor did she know how Gamora would handle it. But she has an update. Thanos escaped and he's no longer on Earth. He got free during the superhero civil war and she has no idea how. Gamora sees that she is up at a space station and Captain Marvel tells her, you're free to go. Go find your father and end this, but don't do it on Earth. If we see you here again, we're going to have to arrest you, and I hope that if we ever see each other again, it's as friends, Gamora. She salutes her and leaves her there. Alpha Flight, meanwhile, has been meeting with the gladiator of the Shi'ar Empire, as he's going to take Gamora far, far away from here. Except one slight problem. She managed to get out and swap places with another green girl, because if Captain Marvel wouldn't tell her that Thanos was here, why would Gamora believe her when she said that he had left? So she makes her way to the S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters, running through explosions and distractions until she finds one of the deepest cells, where she opens it up to see that Thanos is in fact gone and then the door slams shut. A hologram of Captain Marvel pops up informing Gamora that she asked her to leave. She explained that Thanos escaped, and now she's broken into the S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters, and this is a crime. They aren't going to just let her go. She punches the door until their fists are bloodied, shouting, YOU CAN'T DO THIS TO ME! Meanwhile, as the Guardians disbanded, Angela, the daughter of Odin, and the sister of the Odin son, flew off to resolve some of her own issues. She went looking for a friend named Sarah, only to find an assassin. He arrives swinging his weapon at her, and she roundhouses him in the head before he throws her down to the streets. So, she throws a lawn gnome at him, and then she flips over him before throwing him into the streets herself. They exchange blows back and forth as he explains that he came looking for Gamora of Titan. But Angela will do as she kicks him and buries his head into the ground before jumping high into the sky to bring her blade to his face. He catches it, and she stabs him in the back. She smiles as she looks down at him. I can make you an offer. I have what I want. I have a ship that can get you off of this planet tonight. You're going to want to leave. He is coming. Everyone in the galaxy knows. Who? He is on his way to take Earth once and for all. Is he alone? No. Angela leaves as the police arrive on the scene and she looks up to the sky. Thanos. Up above the Earth, approaching it fast, is everyone that hates Earth to finish the Earth once and for all. Out of the negative zone, all of Earth's enemies decided that it was time. Annihilus, the Queen of the Brood, the Badoon, are all talking to Thanos. Because the Earth is a threat, it has caused problems, and it is known that the end of the universe will begin with it. So all of the beings in space have decided to just remove this threat once and for all by destroying the planet. In this endeavor, they decided to bring in Thanos, the Mad Titan, but he has one demand. They will not destroy Earth. They will take it, and he will have it. The other threats of the galaxy try to convince him that this is a terrible idea, but it is the only way that he'll join their battle. Over in the S.H.I.E.L.D. helicarrier, Captain Marvel, Peter Quill, and Rocket Raccoon are all sitting trying to come up with a plan so that the Guardians can get off the world again. Peter has been involved in a bank heist and then community service while Rocket was just blowing up things in New York, but we'll get to those stories soon enough. Rocket stands on the table, eyeballing Carol angrily. We came all the way across the Fratuckin galaxy! Please don't torture me with this again. To help you win a stupid superhero Fratuck fest! I know the sequence of events that have led to this. We help, you win, and our ship gets blowed up! Peter turns to her. 
Carol, there has to be something you can do to help us. And she pulls up a map that leads to a Earth spaceship scrapyard with Rocket's eyes going wide. You have a Vertucken spaceship graveyard and I'm just now hearing about it? Meanwhile, over at the Brooklyn Bridge, Kitty Pride and Ben Grimm the Thing, two former Guardians of the Galaxy, look up to see the invasion. Groot, who has moved over to Central Park to become a tree living a peaceful life, is suddenly shrouded by these ships, to which he says, I am Groot. And Flash Thompson, Venom, looks out the window as he was trying to get a new job, and he sees it approaching. The Guardians might not be friends right now, but they see when they're needed. Hopefully. Across a loudspeaker from the invasion force, everyone begins to hear a voice calling out, People of Earth, hi. This is not an invasion. It is not an act of war or hostility. This is a greeting. We are inviting you to join the galactic common good of species. But there is one little thing that you have to allow us to do before we can welcome you with open arms. We have to remove a cancer from the galaxy that is hiding on your planet. You are harboring intergalactic terrorists known as the Guardians of the Galaxy. Once we remove them, we will start the process of inclusion. And then we see it's Thanos making those empty threats. Over at the SHIELD headquarters, Peter suits up, and Rocket walks past him. You gotta get me to the spaceship graveyard. Rocket, Thanos is right outside of the door. I knows! All you ever do is talk about shooting him in the butt. It's literally all you talk about. You gotta get me to those spaceships or we're all gonna die. So Peter turns to Carol. How fast can you fly? And then we see Carol holding Rocket on her back, hitting top speeds while Rocket's lips peel back from the insanity of it all. Peter pops on his mask and he turns to see Drax. And Drax is smiling because Thanos just landed in the shield helicarrier. The first man into the fight is Drax himself. And the first thing that he does is punch Thanos in the nose. As he's thrown back, Drax jumps high, but Thanos catches him out of midair. The Destroyer still lives. I would have thought you long dead alongside your pathetic wife. So Drax kicks Thanos in the nuts. Thanos then throws him off the side of the helicarrier. Peter rockets in with the might of shield behind him. But as he's about to enter the fight, Carol calls back. Peter, I know where Gamora is. We're holding her. You're holding her? You know why. Okay, well, I don't want to tell you how to do your job. Then maybe now is a good time to let her out. Peter then begins his battle with Thanos, wondering, where are all of the superheroes? There's like 15 spider people. There are so many X-Men. And then Thanos gives him a death glare. Goodbye, Star-Lord. But as he goes in to kill him, we hear something. I. And it seems to be getting closer. M. And closer still until it sucker punches Thanos. Groot! Peter raises his gun. Psst. I knew you were going to say that. And he opens fire. Thanos grabs Groot, throwing him in the way of the blast. And Peter yells out sorry as Agent Venom jumps in from behind him, telling him, oh, I got this. As S.H.I.E.L.D. is calling out to abandon the ship, Groot, Venom, and Star-Lord begin to beat down on the Mad Titan. Meanwhile, up in space, the enemies of Earth are all seeing what is happening. Thanos really is a madman. He fell apart the moment we gave him the stage. Annihilus turns to the Queen of the Brood. I say we go with the original plan. And the Badoom Command agrees. Thus, they begin the destruction of Earth with Thanos still on it. Down on the planet, Thanos reaches out for Peter to try and finish him off, only to have Kitty Pride arrive, sticking her fingers up Thanos' nose so that she can flip over his head. She then phases him through the floor, dropping him down to the planet where a rocky fist is awaiting. And as he lands, we hear the famous line, That's clobbering time! You're welcome, Shins! And then he throws Thanos as far as he can hit him. Thanos gets up, blood dripping from his face. I will make you all watch them burn! Meanwhile, as the attack force gets ready for the massive destruction of Earth. They call out for the Queen of the Brood to give the word, but instead they hear another voice. The Queen of the Brood will no longer be joining your alliance of blood. And then we see Angela sitting on the throne. She and the rest of her kind have fallen. I am Angela, the Hunter Angel, the Odin's daughter, and never come back. And with that, she smiles. Annihilus and the Badoon command structure all agree. It's time to leave. Except as they go for their grand escape, there's something standing in their way. Captain Marvel and a horde of ships that Rocket Raccoon rebuilt. Down on Earth, every guardian of the galaxy, except for a missing Tony Stark, stands before the fallen Mad Titan. Yet, he still tries to intimidate them. The Earth is mine! Really? Since when? Did you bring your receipt? We're really gonna have to see your receipt. And then he hears one more voice that he hasn't seen yet, as Gamora stands behind him. Hello, father. Needless to say, I have dreamed of this exact moment. The moment before I execute you with my own hands. Gamora, all of this could have been yours. All of it. But instead... She looks at him, and memories of her past begin to flood in her head, and she grits her teeth and charges her weapon up. All of her friends look on at her, unable to, unwilling to stop her. And she tells him, after chasing you across the galaxy, back with a crazed bloodlust in my eyes, to see you like this instead, it seems it is just fine. He gets up furious. You sicken me! And they all jump in to finish off Thanos. 
Shortly after this, the Nova Corps arrives to arrest Thanos and haul him off of Earth finally. No words were really exchanged nor needed in the farewell, because it was time for the Guardians to leave the planet. Drax shook hands with his fellow warrior Ben Grimm while Peter and Kitty Pryde decided to leave it where it was. She would stay on Earth and he would move on. The X-Men need her more right now. Venom and Rocket said their goodbyes, and Captain Marvel took selfies with Gamora. As Kitty, Angela, Ben, Venom, and Carol all watched, the Guardians of the Galaxy took off back into space. And with that, the Guardians are going to be on many more adventures, but the epic journey that Brian Michael Bendis brought them on comes to a close. And there you have it. If you're still here after watching this crazy long video, you're awesome, and thank you so much. Rob, come here and tell them how awesome they are. Come over here. If they, if you, sir, or ma'am, have watched my entire Guardians of the Galaxy run <laughs> as a giant video. Oh, you do a giant video out of it? We're doing a giant video. Is it the uh, Bendis run? Yes, Dude, the Bendis it's, run. It's, it's a really good run. See? It's really there you good. go. Do you have, it, like, the symbiote planet and everything? Yeah, all it's going to be in there. And, like, this is the ending. They've seen it all at this point. Oh, okay. The new origins, fighting Thanos. Yeah. I don't I don't like that Peter Quill beat Thanos in, like, on the moon. Ah, no. The, on the moon was cool. When Thanos came to Earth and got hit by like two punches, that was not cool. That was but cool. either way, that was just Brian Michael Bendis being like, what up? Anyway, yeah. I hope you guys enjoyed. <laughs> Thank you guys for sticking Please. it out, and we'll see you next time.